Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the SITREP Podcast. Today I am joined by my friend Piotr. Uh, hello Piotr, how are you doing? Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Jim Beats Piotr in Panzer Leader. Says the guy who's beat so me like, like yeah, says the guy who's beat me like four out of five times, but that's okay. Um, okay, so for today's episode, we're looking at our old friend Panzer Leader, uh, as Piotr mentioned, and this time we're headed to the Libyan Desert in early 1942. So, you know, recently Piotr and I have completed another game of Panzer Leader uh, in this new setting, and uh, today we're going to review the game uh, and the battle and discuss, you know, what happened, uh, what should have happened, what might have happened, you know, that kind of thing. So the battle that we're looking at today is Wadi El Fareg. Um, this is a small and little-known engagement uh, between German and British armored and mechanized forces in January 1942. So if you're watching this, you're probably familiar with the desert uh, campaign of World War II at least a little bit. Um, Italian forces based in Libya attacked British forces based in Egypt in 1940. The British positively curb stomped the Italians really bad and shoved them back into Libya so hard that the Germans felt compelled to sort of send the Italians some help with a somewhat out of favor general and a few fragments of leftover divisions that weren't going to be ready in time for the invasion of Russia. And of course that's where we see Rommel and the beginnings of the Africa Corps. So they kind of got started in uh, March and April of 41. Uh, Rommel surprises the, uh, the British who have overextended their success against the Italians. Uh, Rommel fails to take Trebrook in his big counteroffensive, but he does put it under an eight month siege. Uh, the British try over and over and over again to break that siege. I won't go through all those battles, um, but they finally succeed with Operation Crusader in November of 1941. So this game that we're going to do today takes place in the aftermath of that uh, Crusader offensive. Um, the British have just badly beaten Rommel and have him heading uh, in headlong retreat back through uh, Libyan uh, Cyrenaica is what we're looking at here. Um, they've retaken Benghazi and they've almost reached the old um, El Aguila crossroads where the British had pushed the Italians back in early 1941. So basically Rommel is right back where he started uh, when he first got to Africa. Um, however, um, as they did so often, the British have critically overextended themselves once they started winning one of these battles, and as Rommel starts to probe these British spearheads and uh, forward positions, he realizes just how scattered, unsupported, and disorganized they are, and he develops these probes, uh, Rommel does, um, into full-scale attacks, and before you know it, the British are on the back foot again. So... Yeah, we, we see where, you know, so here's Tobruk, uh, where this campaign kind of started in November of 1941. Um, the British have sort of swarmed through here, and they've kind of come around this way. These are the two real ways uh, through Cyrenaica. You can capture a lot of, uh, you know, enemy forces uh, in these big pockets here, in these mountain passes or whatever. And they're about ready to uh, smash through El Aguila here, but now, you know, the British are disorganized, they're overextended, their supplies and artillery are way behind their spearheads. Rommel says, just how tough are these positions? Oh, they're not very tough at all. They start to crumble like glass. And uh, the British realize, holy crap, we've overextended ourselves again. They start headlong retreat. Um, they're trying to get back to some of these passes, the British are, to where they have more defensible uh, positions and locations, uh, where they can hold Cyrenaica a little bit better, um, and Rommel, as usual, is just too fast for them. So what we're going to be looking at in today's battle is one of these British retreats. So the British are sort of falling back uh, along this line, back here through Wadi El Fareg. And as they're trying to kind of get back to this crossroads where they can maybe set up a better position, this is 2nd Armored Brigade, 1st Armored Division, they get cut off from the north by a little comp group of spearhead uh, detached from 15th Panzer Division. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, today. So before we started, um, Piotr chucked the D6, um, and that indicated that he was going to play the Germans, and therefore um, I was going to play the British, and that's pretty much where we started off. So, here's our map, and then uh, if we scroll down a little bit, we're going to see our beginning forces. So, Piotr, how do you think this compares with some of the more recent uh, Panzer Leader battles that we've uh, been playing uh, more recently? This uh, was, uh, it's, forces, no. It was really small. <laughs> yeah. I had so little counters, I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> so, for the British, um, we're looking at um, elements, again, of 2nd Brigade, 1st Armored Division. Um, the scenario card gets into all the subunits. Uh, I won't get into it now, but we have really detailed information about what was here. 
Um, but really what we have now are um, three troops of Valentines and about eight troops of, um, of the Crusader. Uh, the famously terrible Crusader. Um, like one of the worst battle tanks ever to be used in a large scale uh, campaign. Um, if you're gonna play, if, if you're gonna play the British in, uh, if you're gonna play the British in the desert, you, you kind of have to get used to the Crusader. And uh, Piotr, you were playing the Germans here, so how about you take us through uh, what we had for the German units? Uh, okay, so we have the 15th um, Panzer Division, and uh, there are some uh, Panzer Cup 3s and Panzer Cup 4s. Uh, the Panzer Cup 3s are uh, A-class weapons, so they are the more important ones, in my opinion, when it comes to this um, a particular scenario. And uh, some Panzer Cup 4s E with the short barrel, so they are H-class weapons. Yep. Uh, and some um, Panzer Cup 2s, which are fast, and it's good because you have some Crusaders, which are also fast in, <laughs> yeah. in this game. So, the, the sort of ubiquitous tank, again, if you play the British, you, you kind of have to get used to the Crusader. If you're playing the Germans through, both, through most of the uh, the classic you know, Rommel-era um, Africa Corps battles, get ready for the Panzer Kampfwagen 3G. Um, the good news for the Germans is it's a damn good little tank. And then we also have, uh, again, there's going to be different elements here. I just kind of grouped it all together. What we're really looking at here is uh, other support elements, also of 15th Panzer Division. We should say that this is a tiny scrap of 15th Panzer Division. This is like one-tenth, maybe, of everything 15th Panzer Division might have been able to put together. Yeah, yeah so here's our tire map. Uh, you'll notice it's a little bit smaller than most Panzer Leader games. Again, you know, we're trying to keep this one a little bit more modest in scale. Um... And again, the only uh, real um, difference, or the only uh, kind of unusual feature here, uh, we do have a wadi, and I'll explain how that works later on. A wadi is like a dry riverbed, and we do have these dunes. So again, we're in the desert, so we're not playing with Panzer Leader terrain rules, we're playing with Arab-Israeli War terrain rules. Arab-Israeli Wars was the third edition of this game that was made specifically, surprise, surprise, uh, for the desert. So when you play Panzer Leader scenarios, World War II Panzer Leader scenarios in the desert, you're really playing Arab is really more um, terrain rules. And uh, yeah, whereas normally the British are over here and the Germans are over here and obviously they have a battle, here, reverse that. Because again, the British are actually trying to retreat. So the British enter from anywhere along the uh, western side of the table and they are trying to get off the eastern edge of the table. Victory is determined not only by uh, units destroyed on either side, but also number of British units that managed to escape off the eastern edge of the table. Remember, they're trying to get back to those more defensible positions in the uh, in the foothills of the Cyrenaic and uh, Libyan mountains uh, back there. Uh, of course, the Germans are coming in from anywhere along the northern edge of the table. Their job is to stop them. So the British are coming in like this, and the Germans are coming in really from anywhere they want along the northern edge of the table. It's how much the British can get away, and how much German stuff they can destroy in the process. And again, I'm playing the British, so I'm moving first. Uh, very simply, uh, I'm moving my forces along this road. Uh, the road gives me the double movement rate. Um, and as my main body kind of pushes through this little town, uh, I know that Piotr's going to be coming in here from the north, so I'm kind of trying to hinge a little bit to the south a little bit. Um, I'm trying to keep both of these roads open. I kind of have two roads I can use to escape off of the eastern edge of the table. I don't have to leave on a road, but of course you move faster on a road, so it, you know, it, it, it behooves you to stick to roads um, as much as possible. I did sort of detach two um, batteries of uh, two-pound anti-tank guns. I tried to put them in that wadi, which probably wasn't a very good move. But my idea was to sort of set up a little bit of flank protection uh, for, for, you know, for when Piotr was going to come out of the north and hopefully I was going to be able to stop him. Um, so that was my move on turn one. And what kind of stuff were you looking at over there on turn one, uh, Piotr? Uh, well, for me, I was expecting that you are going to use the road at, uh, during your first turn because it gives you the speed advantage. Um, I was thinking that I should... Uh, come from the north, but uh, on the second half of the map, so to speak, because uh, I was afraid that if you start rolling with your um, Crusaders with the speed of 9 and all your tracks on the road, I won't be able to catch you. 
So my uh, first idea was to um, set up a defensive position uh, uh, in the palm groove uh, in the wadi and some uh, heavy anti-tank guns uh, on the hills to protect the road because they have uh, the range and uh, use my uh, light tanks, uh, the Panzerkampfwagen 2 uh, in order to destroy your little detachment that you put into the wadi but uh, after after the battle, I think that I should have used my scout cars for this role and um, not the not the tanks with the A class weapons that could have been useful later on. That's yeah. the plan. Um, so yeah, here are the uh, SD KFZ 222 scout cars uh, from uh, again uh, Panzer Recon Battalion uh, 33, um, and then down here are the two. Uh, platoons of Mark II um, tanks, which also have a speed rate of 10. They're very fast. They're kind of, they were, in the interwar period, they were kind of designed as, as scout tanks. Um, they did overrun these two positions of um, two pounder anti-tank guns. I was not able to shoot at him as he was doing that because I was still limbered behind my trucks. So short-term success, he did wipe out my flank guard there. But yeah, light tanks overrunning unarmored trucks that are towing or, you know, light anti-tank guns behind them. Those anti-tank guns are not set up. Um, not, not, not a tough battle for the Germans. Uh, meanwhile, I realized I kind of screwed up uh, when I set up some of my Crusaders here. I do have range on those positions, but when you're in a wadi, you are beneath the surface of the desert. That wadi is a very, very broad, almost 100 yard wide kind of a ditch. And once units get into the wadi, I can't see them. So all I saw were some flames, some smoke, and some panic yelling on the radios. Two batteries of two-pounders were pretty much wiped out of my order of battle there. Okay, so here we are at the beginning of turn two, and um, yeah, things are already heating up as we can see. So to wrap up my turn super fast, um, I was able to counter overrun his two platoons of Mark IIs with two troops each of uh, my Crusaders. So I overran his position while after he had just overran my position. Basically, uh, Piotr lost a two platoons of uh, Panzer IIs in exchange for two batteries of um, two-pounder anti-tank guns. Um, I think he got the worst end of that trade. Um, the bad news for me is that I have also lost four more troops. Sixteen Crusaders are now burning. Um, four tanks to a troop. Uh, yeah, I just lost half of my Crusaders in one one fell swoop here. So if I remember correctly, what I did was I pushed my whole truck convoy uh, and, and Bren carriers like south. I'm trying to get them off this eastern edge of the table. There's the eastern edge of the table right there. Um, and he starts to move his Mark III's down here a little bit. What was really starting to worry me was his scout cars. So he had two scout cars that were really fast with H-class weapons. That's high explosive automatic cannon. And if he got down into the middle of this unarmored convoy of trucks and Bren carriers with tissue-thin armor with those little 20mm auto cannons, uh, they're just going to friggin' kill everything. I was desperate to make sure that didn't happen. So as he sent those two half-track uh, cars up that side of the road there, um, I took opportunity fire from the Crusaders. I managed to kill one um, troop of, uh, or one platoon of armored cars pinned down the other one, so success there. The problem is, now that I have taken my opportunity fire, um, yeah, Piotr bomb rushes me with, uh, one, two, three, four, five, that's 20, um, no, 25, I'm sorry, uh, Mark III Gs, and, uh, overruns four, uh, troops of, uh, Crusader twos. And, uh, how did that go for you, Piotr? As if the map didn't make it obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, uh, you decided to destroy my Panzer Cup That was uh, that was actually I wasn't expecting that because I thought that you are going to push uh, west, uh, especially with your uh, uh, Valentines, which are <laughs> slow well, as hell, yeah. and that and that you are going to use the Crusaders in order to protect your little truck convoy that uh, suddenly when they saw smoke coming from the Vadi, someone yelled, run for the hills, and they all <laughs> went for the hills. Uh, but you did something else, and that made me sad. So well, one I, thing I definitely did not want to do is I wanted, did not want to have any Mark IIs running around behind me. I've played enough okay. of these games where, man, those fast armor running around behind you is never a good thing. 
ever. Oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, so I uh, set up a little trap and uh, I use my uh, scout cars uh, as a bait for your crusaders because I was hoping that you are going to shoot, uh, shoot them. I knew that I could take a, a longer road with the scout cars that, uh, the, 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 and they would be safe because they would be out of range of your uh, crusader tanks. But uh, you, you shot at them, uh, you, you, you took your shots and I was able to destroy your crusaders with my, uh, with my uh, panzer boys. Mark, your, your, your armored car started off, and I think it was this thing, somewhere around here, and they went straight south. They could have, um, the, to, to your point, to support your point, with an armor rating, or, I'm sorry, with a movement rate of 10, they could have backed up a little bit and still kind of gotten dangerously close to my, my convoy here and thus been out of the range of my crusaders. Uh, but by heading straight down there, I, I was like, I'm probably going to get clobbered, but as far as whether or not I fell for the trap, I'll say this much, it was dilemma tactics. If I did not knock out, or at least slow down, those two platoons of armored cars, that would have been it. So, I kind of saw what was coming, I just couldn't help it. Um... Because, yeah, because you're now going to move against my Crusaders with all your Mark 3s. Your Mark 3s were not going to reach my truck convoy. They're not fast enough, and they were further away. Those uh, armored cars were closer, and they're faster. They were a threat. And as far as these tanks go, well, you know, bite the pillow and think of England, dude. Because this is an evacuation game. This is Dunkirk in the desert. I have to get as much stuff off the table as I humanly can. And if that means sacrificing some units further north... Now... I didn't mean to sacrifice half my crusaders in one die roll. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that. Um, but, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the, the point, is I have to slow down your advance out of the north long enough for some of my stuff to escape from the east. Uh, I can, I'll say this much. At the beginning of this turn, or at the end of this turn, what was really supposed to put some sand in my britches here were these two platoons of Mark IVs. That was not making me happy right there. Okay, and here we are at the uh, beginning of turn three. And, um, yeah, here is where things get uh, desperately close, at least uh, for some of my British units. Um, of course, as the British player, I'm going first each turn. And um, I'm managing to get most of my stuff off the table. In fact, all of my Bren carriers have already escaped. Because, um, again, yeah, this, this screenshot is kind of like at the end of turn three. So my Bren carriers... That's uh, times three Bren carriers and times three um, infantry platoons have es already escaped the board. So I already have six escaped units. That is 18 victory points. Um, so the British have already had some things kind of go their way. Here's the bad news. Uh, some of these trucks, um, some of these uh, armored cars to finally catch up with them, and the armored cars that are left. And even worse, I've got two overruns here from Piotr of his Mark IV E's. And Mark IV E's with short barreled 75 millimeter guns with high explosive ammunition overrunning unarmored trucks. How well do you think that goes? Um, who's walking away from that get together? Um, yeah, so these two units were just beyond destroyed um, with their passenger units because, again, they were actually carrying, uh, looks like a machine gun and a 76 millimeter mortar section. Um, is what was going on there. Um, so I'll go ahead and clam up now, and Piotr, uh, what kind of stuff were you looking at here when you were um, deploying your tanks here in turn 3? Uh, well, I, since it was my first game uh, on the desert, I was uh, trying to take advantage of the uh, hull down rule, yep. yes, uh, uh, with the dunes, um, uh, because actually I had mixed feelings uh, during the game because I was trying to kill as much of your stuff as I could. On the other hand, uh, I was playing quite aggressively uh, from time to time, which, uh, as you will see in the next turns, uh, cost me a, a bit. Uh, but I had to block you, so I uh, decided to stay here behind the dunes and send uh, part of, uh, of my Panzer Force uh, a little bit down uh, southeast in order maybe next turn to catch up and destroy what's left of your uh, trucks and matadors if you decided to uh, unload uh, your uh, forces. And I decided to block the road by putting two uh, 3.7 uh, centimeter anti-tank guns on the hills uh, oh, right. next to the road. I totally forgot about these guys, right? Okay, so here's the broad view of turn four. 
and uh, yeah, super fast. What I'm doing is, again, once I kind of realized that the rest of my units were not going to make it off of that southeast corner there, I fell back and I dismounted my 25 pounder howitzers and my 40 millimeter anti uh, aircraft guns. And I was like, let me at least make a, let, make a stand. Meanwhile, the rest of my British lumber tried to get through as quickly as possible. Uh, that was pretty much my big move in, uh, in turn four. So, uh, Piotr, uh, what were you up to uh, in turn four here? Well, I was trying to overrun uh, your uh, guns, but I made a crucial mistake. Well, maybe not a crucial mistake, but I made a small mistake. You can see the smoke uh, in 21.0, oh, no, 31.09, I believe. Oh, yeah. uh, that was one of my anti-tank guns. I moved it before I destroyed your anti-aircraft gun that was already unloaded, so you took advantage and used the uh, opportunity to fire to destroy it. And uh, since I saw what you're doing with your armor, that you're not going to try to push it uh, the northern, uh, uh, the northern part of the road, I started to take uh, take all my troops, load them on trucks, and you know go go south, and maybe join the fight uh, later. Except for my commander, because uh, as we were joking during the stream, he's you know having some. A uh, good time uh, making the barbecue in, <laughs> in the yeah. pump crew. He, he's just up there, have, he's up there ha having a nice afternoon off. He, he's just like, yeah, guys, yeah. Dude, th this battle's on the rails. Just go ahead and take care of it. Call me if you need anything. Did Doris County escape already? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Rispini's running as fast as he can. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I so got a little bit greedy, if I can add, because I, I took this uh, two Panzer uh, Cup 4. And platoons and decided to attack. Uh, oh, right. One platoon should attack uh, one uh, of your 25 pounders. So I couldn't roll uh, that low in order to destroy them. So they got only dispersed, which slowed down my <laughs> grind of your force. Yeah. So there was a there was a battery of 25 pounders dismounted from behind their Matador trucks here, and there was another one here. And Peter had two uh, platoons of Panzer Mark IVs. Uh, in that hex. He had basically uh, three choices. He could send both platoons to overrun um, he could send both platoons to overrun that hex. He could send both platoons to overrun this hex or he could split it up and send one platoon into that hex and one platoon into that hex. Um, he chose that third option and that's why we see a destroyed uh, 25 pounders here and these 25 pounders are really pinned down. So he split up his attack in two directions. He got he wound up with mixed results. His armored cars also tried to overrun uh, my 40 millimeter Bofors battery that just killed his uh, 3.7 centimeter anti tank battery up there. Um, and again, uh, pinned him down, but did not uh, actually destroy them yet. Um, yeah, the German forces qualitatively are better than the British forces. Obviously, their tanks are just much better. Um, also, their morale is much better. Uh, British morale in this particular battle was pretty bad. Um, Second Brigade uh, First Armored Division was mostly made up of brand new regiments that had just arrived from Great Britain. They were not acclimated to the desert yet. They didn't know which way was up. Uh, and that's reflected in the uh, morale ratings here in our scenario. But uh, yeah, I do have a lot of armor on their way to help on the south side of the on the west side of the slopes. So we're going to see what happens here um, in turn five. Okay, so here we are on the, at the end of turn five, and um, yeah, things here got a little uh, started to get a little bit crazy. Um, so uh, Pewter sort of consolidated some of his armor here with his Mark threes joining his Mark IVs. Uh, I did manage to destroy his last platoon of uh, armored cars uh, there. That's another burning wreck count you see underneath there. All right. He had managed to knock out my 40mm Bofors anti-aircraft mount. Um, yeah. I tried to overrun his Mark IVs here. That's these two overrun mark, uh, markers here with my just arriving Crusaders. It did not work. So on Piotr's turn, he was able to take those Mark IVs and kind of cut back around. And uh, as a result, sort of, you know, overrun those uh, anti-tank, those anti-aircraft guns I was talking about before. So I wasn't too happy about that. Um, meanwhile, the rest of his Mark III's sort of came around my backside here and started to overrun my poor Valentines that were just starting to chug back into the battle. These poor Valentines, they have a rate, movement rate of 4. 
it's taken them five turns to even reach the main part of the battle here. And as soon as they get here, what happens? They get overrun by two platoons of, uh, of Mark Threes. Notice the route that Piotr took here. Um, he did so to screen his advance so that the majority of my armor would not have the opportunity to take uh, opportunity fire or reaction fire uh, to prevent the overrun. Um, because he sort of used this curvature of the ridge here to, uh, to his benefit. And thus he was able to overrun up the, uh, up the slope here and um, take out this tank um, platoon that was sitting right there. So, yeah, meanwhile, a lot of infantry and 5 centimeter anti-tank guns are coming down here out of the north. He's really doing a good job of sealing off this road and sealing off any further um, escape uh, possibilities I might have here off the southeast corner of the map. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty much where I was uh, at turn 5. Um, how about you, Peter? Mm, I, uh, I started to play a little bit aggressively without it being necessary. So I took two uh, platoons of my Panzer Cup 3s, uh, used the ridge advantage so that you cannot see me, came from the back and destroyed your troop of Valentines. And, but then uh, we had a long pause in the game. I could hear John, Jim snoring because, you know, I was thinking what to do, what to do. There are so <laughs> many. <laughs> There are so many uh, Crusader troops over there and with so many angles uh, uh, for opportunity fire. I cannot come in without losing uh, tanks and I should not lose tanks over here because I have less tanks with A-class weapons than he has. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I decided to pull back, pull back a little bit, use the dunes um, in order to have the hull down advantage when it comes to defense and wait to see what happens. Uh, however, as you will see <laughs> next turn, it did cost me a little bit, uh, but uh, let's not, you know, uh, go too far into the future and let Jim speak about his turn 6. Alrighty. Alright, so here we are on turn 6. Uh, we're coming near the end of the game. Again, I get victory points for getting British units, combat units, British combat units off the east end of the table. The priority is getting units off the table. I get three points for every British combat unit off the table. I only get two points for destroying a German combat unit. However, um, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious that escape off of the southeast uh, corner of the board here, he now has like three concentric layers of uh, stuff I'm going to have to get through. Yeah, I'm, let's just go ahead and call that southeast corner secure. I'm not going to get much off of these, uh, much off of these hexes here. So what I'm going to try and do is maybe I have just enough time to get some of my faster units off the table further to the north. What's going to help facilitate that is if I can shut down some of his faster, especially his faster powerful units. And when I say faster powerful units, I'm talking about Mark III Gs. These things are the bane of any uh, British player uh, in the desert. Uh, 1941 and 42 is the Panzer Mark III G specifically. The J is even worse, but that is that comes in much later in the war. Um, he had two of those platoons back here. These are the two guys that just cold-blooded murdered my poor Valentine there at the back of my column. So guess what? I went ahead and bomb rushed him with one, two, three, four, five platoons of Valentines and Crusaders. Uh, he did take out one of them in opportunity fire, but then in the subsequent overrun, I took out two platoons of his Mark Threes. So I traded a platoon of Crusaders and a platoon of Valentines for two platoons of Mark III Gs. So with almost half of his Mark Threes destroyed right there in that one hex, uh, my Valentines are pretty much screwed because they're just not fast enough. They only have a movement rate of four. But my Crusaders that have a movement rate of nine are now going to have a pretty easy chance to sort of you know swing up here really fast. Crusaders are terrible, but they are fast. That's the one saving grace. Um, and now that hill that Piotr was using to sort of screen his advance down here to the south is now working in my favor because all of these ridge lines, all of these elevation contours are now screening me uh, from his counter fire off the top of that hill. And these guys are just not going to be fast enough uh, to redeploy again. So at least that was my thinking here on turn 6. Uh, Piotr, what, did you, what were you doing on turn 6 besides crying about your burning Mark 3s? 
Well, actually, when I saw my Burning Man Freeze, I, I thought that this Valentine's that I have destroyed the turn earlier must have been carrying your supply of tea or something, because <laughs> you unleashed hell on my Master Cap Force, and I did not see a reason to do that. <laughs> uh, the reason, it, yeah, those are your best tanks, again, so he's got H-class weapons here on these Mark, um, uh, on these two platoons of Mark IVs. So H-class weapons are terrible at attacking tanks. Those are the really, really, really short L24 uh, 7.5 centimeter howitzers. They absolutely rule at blowing up trucks, infantry, artillery positions, bunkers, entrenchments, improved positions, anything not made of metal. Okay, once you're talking about tanks, those H's go from gold to garbage. Um, they are absolutely nothing uh, after that. He can't even overrun an armor target because per strict interpretation of Arab Israeli war rules, in order to overrun an armor target, you need to be packing an armor-piercing weapon. Uh, and that's going to be uh, these A's up here. So, long story short, take your first shot. What I'm really worried about here are his A-class weapons at this point. All my trucks are either dead or escaped. So those Mark IVs that used to be, that on turns 3, 4, and 5 were his most important units are now his least important units because the battlefield has changed literally in the space of one turn. Everything that I have left is armored, so those H-class weapons are not really that very effective. That leaves me with just five platoons of Mark III Gs to worry about, okay? And if I get a chance to take out two of them, that's almost half. And his effective army, the army that's going to bother me through the rest of the turns of this game, just got reduced by 40%. So that's why I made that big swing backwards, to sort of backward overrun uh, here into Hex uh, 2314. All right, so uh, here's the zoom out at the beginning of turn seven. Um, as you can see, this battlefield is awfully big, uh, but it's sort of concentrated down here in the south. This is something you see in the desert a lot. A lot of maneuver, a lot of sweeping, flanking maneuvers and, and movements, and this, that, and the other thing. And then the battle will just implode on this tiny little localized area. And you'll see a very, very small piece of desert that just is witness to incredible violence. Um, and then it'll break loose again. So that's kind of what we saw here. We saw who knows where on this gigantic battlefield um, we're going to have a big confrontation. Oh, it's going to be down here in the southeast. Oh, everyone rush down here to the southeast. Have a big battle. Small columns, burning tanks, red counters. Uh, a whole big mess. And now that that's over, I smashed these two platoons, again, those Mark III's we were talking about earlier, and that sort of reopened the door for a lateral, a lateral redeployment. You'll see where my Crusaders are bolting up this way and my remaining uh, Valentines are bolting up that way. Uh, I, we're back to maneuver. Um, so, any thoughts about uh, what's going on here on turn 7? Well, at this point I knew I won't catch a Crusaders, it makes no point. But, but I was a little bit cautious with maneuvering my mm, Panzer, my, what was left of my Panzer force. He's a little gun shy, folks, after I blew up two of his Mark III platoons. Now he's all like, oh my god, I'm not invincible. <laughs> These Crusaders are bad. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but uh, I was, you know, a little... A little afraid that you are going to do some kind of, um, you know, cavalry style last minute uh, turn down south to destroy what's left of my tanks. So um, I, I I knew uh, that I will cut off your um, uh, Valentines or your poor poor Valentines, poor Valentines. <laughs> as you tend to call them. Uh, but I just uh, wanted to give you some time in order, you know, to, uh, to escape with the Crusaders so that you don't shoot at me anymore. <laughs> uh, my poor Valentines. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're not getting anywhere. But if I can get those two Crusader troops off the table, it'll be like six more victory points. Who knows if it'll be enough to help win the game. Uh, but that's what I was trying to do here in turn, uh, in turn seven. And then finally we come to turn eight, guys. All right, there's not much going on here. The British are tabled. They are gone. There is not a single living British unit left on the table at the end of turn 8. Those two Crusaders did manage to get off of the eastern side of the table, as everyone kind of predicted. And as also predicted, those two uh, troops of Valentines just weren't fast enough. So he came at me with uh, one platoon of Mark III's here, two more platoons of Mark III's here. I managed to use opportunity fire, that's sort of like reaction fire in most other games, uh, to shoot up this platoon and pin it down before it could overrun me. But then these two guys kind of came in on my right flank here. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much the end of my two Valentine uh, troops there. And that 
pretty much uh, shuts down the game. So if you see here, um, if we zoom out to the whole battlefield, yeah, there's not a single British unit anywhere on the table. Every British unit has either died or, um, or, ha or, or has already escaped. So quite honestly, um, you can't have a game with only one army on the table. That's going to end the game. So now it's all down, uh, except for the counting up of the score. Okay, so the Germans have destroyed 16 British units. They get two points for every British unit killed at the beginning of the game. Or, you know, we set up those victory conditions. So 16 kills. Again, that does not count trucks. Um, it has to be a combat unit. So trucks and matadors do not count. So they got 16 kills. That's 32 points. Nothing is left stranded on the table. So he gets zero points for that. He winds up with 32 points. Uh, meanwhile, we have the British, who, um, uh, as you can see, only killed seven German units. So in kills, he beat me over two to one. Um, that's not that unusual. That's the kind of stuff you see in the desert all the time. Um, however, I did get eight units off the table. That is three platoons of infantry, three platoons of universal carriers, and two troops of crusader tanks. That's eight total escapes. I get three points for units per unit that escaped. That's 24 total. 14 and 24 equals 38. This shook out as a narrow British win, 38 to, uh, to 32. I was crying all night. You were crying all night? <laughs> I bet you were. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually it was, a, it was a really good game. I liked it. The, the number of, uh, of units that I was afraid of at the beginning because <laughs> there were so not so many units as I am used to when it comes to playing Punch Leader with Jim actually mm, came out as an advantage uh, because we had some maneuver, we had some uh, classical break-offs, we had some standoffs, and you had to you know, uh, take good care of the, uh, of the resources that you have, so management is a key when it comes to this desert uh, battles, uh, plus of course the terrain, the terrain uh, makes a big difference and if you know how to use this uh, hull down advantage, uh, hiding behind the dunes, or um, hiding in the, in the palm trees. Uh, it's uh, it's really important because <laughs> when you're in the desert, there's almost nowhere to hide, uh, and uh, overruns is something that happens all the time, uh, which is not so common in the eastern or western front. Uh, well, as, at least for when it comes to the map that I have been playing uh, at so far. But it was a really good game, and Jim was, uh, as always, a, a good sport for me. <laughs> when it comes to, to, to playing Punch Leader. Cool. All right, everybody, with that, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks once again, and uh, as always, for all your support. And we'll be in touch with everybody very soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye.